Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning? Just a little, just jump in. Um, I actually, instead of the word of the Lord, I'll go to the New York Times uh, to get us started. Uh, I, was, I was just noticed this article uh, that came out uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And basically what it was taught, what, what the title was, is how to talk to people again. <laughs> it has to do with the fact that we've been in basically quarantine for a year and we're just coming out of it. And it seems like that there, in fact, the way that it starts, it says after a year of isolation, there's just some things you start to forget. And primarily it's talking about, you know, communication. And I, I actually identified a lot with this particular uh, article because I have found myself having really awkward conversations. Uh, and it's not, it's not so much the words, it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a hugger. And so if you know me, I like, you know, I'll do the side hug thing. I love, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's, that's how I roll. But during COVID, you know, for a while, it's like, okay, don't touch at all. In fact, social distance, just stay away. Just, you know, don't get near me kind of thing, which, which hurts a hugger. But then, you know, we started coming out of that. And so we started figuring out, okay, how are we going to do this? So what, what was the first thing that we started doing? We started elbow bumping, right? And so that's where we were for like a year. We're elbow bumping everybody. So now when I go to talk to somebody and we're done talking, man, hey, good to see you, you know, and I'll go to do the elbow bump and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do that. I'm not, you know, and then they're like, no, we can fist bump now. And then I go to do that and I'm not confident with that. So and I'm like, should we handshake or are we not touching? What, what are we doing here? Because it feels very, very awkward, right? Is anybody identifying with this? You know exactly where I'm at, right? So, but let's just say, that the awkwardness is over. So I've always thought that it would be so incredible when it comes to having a, a conversation with somebody, if we could just pick a person, any person that you've ever heard of, whether they are from history or whether they are alive now, but any person in the world, just to sit down with them at a, at a coffee shop and have a conversation with them, anybody that you want. And so I was thinking about this and I got really curious. I was like, well, who would, who would people actually want to sit down with? Because that's, that's interesting, right? If you were asked that question, you'd probably have a number of names that come to your mind. So I did what I always do. I Googled it because that's what we do, right? And so uh, here's some of the names that came up of people that, you know, other individuals wanted to sit down and talk to. And I, and I get it, Leonardo da Vinci. Anybody understand that one? I mean, that makes sense, right? Pretty great guy in history. Martin Luther King Jr., Totally get it. People would want to sit down and talk with him. Makes sense. Julius Caesar. That would be interesting, right? Okay. But the name that kept coming up over and over and over again in all of these things of who people would want to talk to that have gone on before was Jim Henson. The founder of the Muppets. And I, I'm looking at this on Google and I'm like, why is the name Jim Henson coming up over and over and over again? I guess he was a great guy. Does anybody have any ideas? Like why Jim, does anybody here want to talk to Jim Henson? Only three, okay. All right, so maybe I was looking at the wrong Google list. Anyway, here's, here's, what, here's what amazes me. Have you ever considered, really pondered how incredibly awesome it is that we can have a conversation with God anytime we want to. With God, right? I'm, ta I'm talking about God here, right? The almighty one, the eternal one, the one that we call, you know, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, the, the one which is and which was and which is to come. We get to have a conversation with him anytime that we want. And if you're around church, if you're, if you're kind of a religious person, if you're a, if you're a person that follows faith, then, then maybe conversation with God doesn't seem like that big a deal because it becomes the norm. But I have to be honest with you because I've been around for a little while and, and while I'm a pastor and while I, I love the Lord and I, I try to walk with the Lord, when it comes to this conversation with God, when it comes to prayer, sometimes stuff just gets in the way. Sometimes it's, it's busy schedules, sometimes it's long to-do lists, sometimes it's even spiritual stuff. How many of you know that you can be all involved in a lot of religious activity about God and never talk to God? And sometimes we just need to be reminded how amazing it is, how powerful it is, and really how simple it is 
that we get to have this conversation with God. Listen, you are a child of God and he is your father. You were created by God. You were created in the image of God. You were created as sons and daughters of God. And by the way, let me just tell you, I believe that that applies to 100% of the world's population. I really do. In fact, this is how I would describe it. I would say that the entire world is made up of children of God. There's just two categories. You're either talking to God or you're not. But we're all children of God and we were created for the express purpose of being in relationship with him. We were created for conversation with him. Real, authentic, transparent, one-on-one, two-way conversation with God. Where you can share your frustrations with God. You can share your day with God. You can even share your anger with God. He's not afraid to hear where you're really at. He will listen. You can ask for help and he will come through. You can ask for wisdom and if you'll listen for a minute, he'll speak to you. It's the ultimate conversation and it changes everything. Listen, you can look throughout all of the scripture and you can see dozens and probably hundreds of examples of people, just ordinary people, not not spiritual superstars, just ordinary people having face-to-face encounters with God and engaging in two-way conversation. That is incredible. I realize we usually call it prayer because that's just what has come down to us in the English language. Other languages, obviously, there would be different words, but we call it prayer. But it's just having a conversation with God. And it always blows my mind how, we, how people have a tendency to get really pious and religious about prayer. In fact, we love, sometimes we love to just make it almost like, you know, if I could just, I want my prayer to be special and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna add in some Elizabethan English. You know, we're gonna go back to the days of the King James Version. We're just gonna throw in some these and some thous and some ETH endings. And you know, it doesn't matter if it's grammatically correct. It doesn't matter if it's poetically nasty. As long as we throw in a few these and thous, it's a really good prayer. So I actually read a prayer last night online and I translated it into Elizabethan for you. So here's the prayer in Elizabethan English. If thou canst not decrease my stature, let thine hand increase the stature of those around me. Now, do you want the real prayer, what the person was really thinking? This is what they prayed. God, if you can't make me skinny, then please make my friends chunky. But didn't the Elizabethan just add something to that? Right? This this is what Jesus said, Luke 11, verse 2. He said to his disciples, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. This is the Lord's Prayer. This is the example that he gave us of how to pray. And I love the fact that it starts with relationship. It starts with the fact that he is your Father and we are his children He doesn't start with pray the agenda first, pray the kingdom come, pray the will be done first. He doesn't start even with your needs, pray that you know we have our daily bread, that all of our financial needs are met. He doesn't even start with your sins. In the Lord's Prayer, it takes down you know three or four things down, and finally it says, and oh, by the way, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me, and then we get into the other parts of the prayer. But it starts with the relationship. He wants you to acknowledge that he is your father and you are his child. Now, I realize he said, let's say our father, so that sounds really corporate, sounds like the whole universal group, but listen to Matthew 6, 6. Jesus says this, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father, who sees everything, will reward you. And the way I like to think about that is if I'm in the, if I'm in the secret place, and I'm praying, and I'm seeking God, what is my reward? God. The Bible says in the Old Testament that if I seek him, I will find him. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this story in the Old Testament. You probably remember the story where Moses actually goes up into the mountain and he's in the direct presence of God for a season. And when he comes down, his face is just glowing from, from the presence of God. I mean, it's so bright that he literally puts a veil over his face so that he could speak face to face with the children of Israel when he came down. Now, I will tell you, this is not part of my sermon, not part of, the, not part of what I want to say today, but I will tell you that over time, and I don't know why this happened it's it's a theological thing i guess but over time the the light on moses face began to fade and he had had that veil on there to show he was in the presence of god and so the people thought as long as the veil was there the the shine was there the glow was there and over time the shine went away and moses actually left the veil on because i guess as a leader he wanted them to think he was still that's a whole nother sermon isn't it right there wow but in this story you know, this is Paul later on. He, he's thinking about this, the Apostle Paul, and he paints this beautiful picture of what it looks like for the people of God, the children of God, not just the leader, not just Moses going into the presence of God, but now the actual children of God going into his presence. And this is what he says. This is how he des- uh, describes it in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, whenever though that we turn uh, to face God, just like Moses did, then God removes the veil and there we are face to face with God. And we get in that moment, it says, and they suddenly recognize that God is a living and personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. So compared to all of the other nations surrounding them who worshiped gods that were made by the hands of men out of stone, out of wood, out of whatever, he says, no, God is something different than that. God is a a living, personal presence with you. And then it says, and when God is personally present, a living spirit, then that old and constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. This old way of of interacting with God that's all based about rules and making sure that you've got all of your I's dotted and all of your T's crossed, then all of, none of... This is so amazing. When we get in the presence of God, when we have a relationship with God, do you realize that rules are no longer necessary? Do you realize, here's what Jesus said. Okay, you've got in the Old Testament 613 commandments that the, that the people of God were called to follow. But when Jesus comes along and they ask him, hey God, what is the greatest commandment? His response to them is to say, hey, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if you can be in relationship with God in a loving relationship, if you can be in relationship with people in a loving relationship, you don't even need all of those other things. In fact, Jesus went on to say that upon These two commands of loving God and loving people hang all of the law and the prophets. So he says that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it, all of us, nothing between us and God. Man, I love that. One of the things that I am just passionate about seeing is people discovering that they really can talk to God. That they don't need a a, a go-between or a spiritual guru to get them there. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you really can talk to God. So not long ago, I sat down with a man named Chris, and I, I love this guy. Chris had a hard life, addicted to drugs for decades, literally over 40 years. And God just did an incredible work in his life. It was amazing. And you could tell, he was, he was new, but you could tell that his heart was turned toward, toward God. I would watch him as, as he was worshiping and his hands would be up and tears would be coming down his cheeks because he was interacting with God. He was receiving the love of God. I know some people might wonder, why do, you, why do you put your hands up when you're worshiping? Why would, you, why would you do that? Well, for one thing, we put our hands up because it's a sign of surrender to God, number one. But we also put our hands up because we think God is awesome. If I can do that, you know, when, uh, when the Cardinals beat the Giants like last night, thank you, Jesus. I can put my hands up, yes! 
Well, I can do that with God as well. But one of my favorite reasons to lift my hands like that in the presence of God is because I remember that girl right there, Christiana Renee Seagraves, when she was about four years old, three to four or five years old, I can remember that she would walk up to me. In fact, she did this to me one time right when I was preaching. She actually walked up to the front and she just a little three or four year old girl and she threw her hands up right in front of me. And I knew she's not worshiping God. She's not, you know, having a moment at three years old. She's looking right at me and I knew exactly what she wanted. What'd she want? She wanted me to pick her up. And I gotta tell you, sometimes, guys, when I'm in the presence of God and I put my hands up, I'm just saying, God, I'm okay if you pick me up right now. You're my father. I'm all right if you just hold me for a moment, right? Well, Chris would do that in the presence of God. He, he loved being in the presence of God, but he sat down with me one day. We were at a, uh, outside, and it was at kind of a picnic table, and, and just, just people kind of walking around, but he began to pour his heart out, and he was just going through an intense time of struggle and hurt and pain. Even though he had turned his life over to God, there were still things that he was struggling with, and he did not hold anything back. I mean, he shared everything. So after about an hour of him just pouring this out, I could just sense in that moment, you know what, I really feel like that it's time to pray. And normally in those kind of situations, I would say, listen, man, um, let, let me pray with you. I'm not gonna pray for you like three days from now. I will do that too. But I wanna pray with you right now in this moment. And I, I was suddenly like in that moment, I just felt like a check somewhere on the inside that said, don't do it. Don't pray for him. You tell him just to sit right there with you, to close his eyes, and for him to talk to me just like he was talking to you. So I, I did, I had no clue you know, what that would look like. I was like, Chris, listen, I don't know why I'm doing this. Normally I would just pray for you, man, but I feel like that what God really wants is for you to sit right here and talk to him like you just talked to me. And he did. And he prayed and he prayed. It was the sweetest thing I've ever heard. And it was, it, it was, it was a pretty lengthy prayer. But when he got done, tears are just streaming down his face. And he looks at me and he says, I have never done that before. And I'm looking at him like, done, done what? Like opened up to somebody? Done, done what? I mean, he says, I've never talked to God before. I said, but I, I see you in church and, and I see your hands up and I see you Tears coming down your face. I mean, you're, you're encountering God. You, what are you talking about? He says, I have never talked to God before. And he's just kind of contemplating that. And all of a sudden, it was like this light just popped into his face. It was like revelation hit him. And he looks at me and he goes, I could do that in my car. <laughs> he said, I could, I could do that at home. I could do it like anytime, like anywhere, right? And I'm like, I felt like God, like in that moment, was just like dancing with joy because somebody got it that you really can have a conversation with God and it doesn't have to be pious and it doesn't have to be religious and it doesn't have to be Elizabethan. It can be just you telling God what you're really going through. This got me to thinking about one of my wife's favorite psalms. I don't have this for you on the, on the slides. I'm just going to read it for you. But this, this is an incredible psalm. Psalm 91 is filled with so many promises for people that are in relationship with God. And I'm going to read it for you because I think it's just awesome. Even if that was all we did today, it would be worth doing. So this is what the psalmist said. Psalm 91 and verse 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. I will trust him. And then listen to this, man. I could use this every once in a while. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Anybody liking it so far? This is good stuff. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor for the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up in their hands so you won't even hurt your foot 
on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. Listen, I love all of that. They're all awesome. I love this entire passage. But verse 15 has got to be my favorite because it says this, when they call on me, I will answer. Isn't that awesome? That God is not far off, that he is not disconnected. He hears us when we pray. And not only does he hear us, but he responds. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with long life and give them my salvation. That's a good one. That's one that's even worth memorizing a little bit. Because this is the heart of of our Father, that we would call upon him and that he will answer. This, this is not an exclusive club of really spiritual people who have all the right language and all the right postures. It's for everybody. In fact, I wanna just keep this really, really simple. And so I'm gonna give you a few principles here and they're the simplest that I could make them. And I want you to write them down if, if you don't have the notes. The first one is this. We can all pray. We can all pray. Everybody say all. all. Remember what the Greek word for all means? It pretty much means all, yeah. <laughs> and I know Pastor Brent's vision for our church family as it relates to prayer is this simple. Every person praying. That's Pastor Brent's vision, and I love it. Every person praying, that's the vision. That's what God is desiring of his people, that every person would pray. Remember Jesus in the Gospels, Mark eleven seventeen, 17, was telling them about what God's heart was about this. He said, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's every person, every man, every woman, every child, every ethnicity, every culture, every educational background, every uh, socioeconomic background. There is no one who is excluded from the invitation to have this conversation with God. Doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you haven't done. God wants this conversation with you. Now, we've got an incredible prayer team here at One Family Church. We've got almost 40 people that are a part of a prayer team that serve in a lot of different ways. They, so when we're praying down in the front, man, they will meet you down here to pray with you. Right now, we're in the prayer rooms. Uh, after the services, they'll meet you there to pray with you. They're praying for needs all of the time. Amazing prayer team. And you can actually join the prayer team. This fall, there'll probably be a life group that's a training for the prayer team. So check that out. It's called Prayer Force. But the other thing that you can actually do right now, we have over 140 people in our church family that are connected to an app that's called Echo. And if you go on our website, you can find out what that's all about. But the Echo app is a prayer app. And it's the way that we submit literally every prayer request that comes into our church family. It goes to that prayer app. Only the, the only ones that don't go there are those that are marked confidential. And they just go to our pastoral team and our ministry council. But every other prayer request goes there every single week. And 140 plus people are interacting with those prayer needs. And you can jump on there, check it out on the website. What I'm saying is that there is no one who is excluded from being a part of this thing called conversation with God. And everybody said amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. So we can all pray. Let me give you another one. Number two, this is also simple. We can always pray. Luke 18 verse one said, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Donald Miller wrote a number of books. One of them was Blue Like Jazz. But he said this, and this, this just jumped out at me. He said, if we knew how much God loved us and if we knew how much God was for us, we would talk to him all day long. Jesus said men ought always to pray and never give up. That means praying in the morning, praying at noontime, praying during the evening. I realize we have our schedules and you gotta, you gotta be on the run and you gotta do your thing. But when we talk about prayer as a conversation, that means you can talk to God at any moment. You can talk to him while you're driving. You can talk to him while you're chewing. You can talk to God while you're working on your to-do list. You can talk to God all through the day. There's no time that you can't talk to God. So we can always pray. And by the way, God likes to hear from you even when you're feeling good. I know we like to pray when we're feeling bad. God, where are you? 
but he also loves it when you just say, God, I am having an awesome day. Thank you so much for, for inspiring that person that created coffee. Thank you, Jesus. Caffeine. So I'm telling you, God's a good God. We can all pray. We can always pray. What do we pray about? We can pray about all things. Listen to this, Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Pray about everything. You guys probably don't remember this. Maybe you do. If you do, you can help me. But we used to sing a hymn that went something like this. What a friend we have in Jesus. You guys remember that? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Watch this. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Think about what we struggle with that we don't need to struggle with because we always try everything else before we try talking to God about it. He says, listen, you can bring everything to me, the small stuff. Please bring me your small stuff. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, he said it's okay to pray about your daily bread. If you were here last week, you know I pray a lot about my daily <laughs> bread. He cares about that. He doesn't care if I pray about pretzels or tortillas, or croissants, or freshly baked loaf bread sliced thick with butter melted on it. He cares about that. Small stuff. <laughs> but he also cares about the big stuff. And it, you know, I, I look at the life of Jesus as a great model for what this conversation looks like because there were moments when Jesus was facing a, a challenge like right there in front of, you know, right there in front of the tomb of Lazarus and to, his, his friend has died and Jesus literally, he's moved with grief because people weren't believing, they weren't filled with faith, but he prayed just a short, simple prayer and bam, Lazarus walks out, it's short and simple. When he teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer, it's a prayer that if you say it word for word can be prayed in 30 seconds. But then there are moments in your life that are significant and they are challenging and they are difficult. And Jesus actually faced one of these because he was thinking about what does this look like when I'm gone? When I ascend up into the heavens, what happens to the kingdom of God? And so this is what the Bible says in Luke chapter six. It says, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, Jesus did. And he continued there all night in prayer to God. And here's the reason why. Because when it was day, he called his 12 disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he also named to be apostles. He said, I've got a, a massive decision to make, and it's one that's going to impact the trajectory of the church reaching the entire world. And so you know what? It's okay that I stay up all night and I bring this to God. It's okay that I walk the floors. It's okay that I turn my attention to God. Listen, he'll listen to the big stuff. He'll listen to the small stuff. You can take everything to him in prayer. If you can't remember everything, then make a list. I have to do that, man. Once I got past 50, I make a list for everything. Number one, get up in the morning. <laughs> pray about everything. Pray about your kids. Pray about your wife. Pray about your husband. Pray about your church. Pray about your pastor. Pray for your city. Pray for your nation. Pray for the world. Don't leave anything out. Because he cares about everything. Listen, we can all pray. We can always pray. We can pray about all things. And where do we start? Number four, we start by praying in faith. Amen. This is what Jesus said, Matthew 21, 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I heard a definition of faith one time said, and it's an orientation of the soul toward God in the form of deep trust. I love that. 
In fact, what I really think, maybe I should have reworded that and said that, you know what, what we really need to do is we need to start praying, trusting. Faith, sometimes we get this idea about faith that it's us making up stuff and then hoping God will do it. But no, faith at its deepest level is trusting God for who he is, that God, you really are my father and you really do want want what's best in my life. And let me tell you what God wants for you. He wants you to be confident children of God who absolutely trust him. And that's why he said in Hebrews chapter four and verse 16, to the children of God, he said, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Everybody say boldly. boldly. In fact, say boldly, boldly, boldly. boldly. I was waiting to hear if I said it, you said it twice. <laughs> boldly to the throne of our gracious God because there we will receive his mercy and we will find the grace to help us when we need it most. You gotta be confident as a child of God. You remember what we talked about last week? You're not walking into the presence of God because you're pretending like you're good. You're walking into the presence of God fully acknowledging that I am a broken, messed up individual but my faith is not in myself. My faith is in what Jesus did, his death, his burial, his resurrection. I am a child of God and I have been justified, declared to be right with God even so all of my behaviors don't quite measure up in this moment. I'm coming in because God is good, not because I'm good. And that's why I can hold my head up and put my shoulders back and come boldly to the throne of God. Hebrews eleven six. anyone who comes to God must believe, first of all, that he's real and that he rewards those who truly want to find him. God said, if you'll call upon me, I will. Will answer. I'm almost done. Jason, could you come on and help me out? How does God respond when we do this? What, what's the other side of the conversation look like, look like? Let me just share with you a few principles real quick about how God does this. First of all, God answers in his own time. I gave you a, a really difficult one first, right? Because we don't like that one. God answers in his own time. You remember Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament? They wanted a child so bad, they never, they hadn't had one. They were like, he was in his 90s, she was in her 80s, something like that. And God promises them that they're gonna have a child and it doesn't happen. A month, two months, three months, four months, five months. It's not happening, but this is what God had told them. Genesis 18, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. God is going to answer at the appointed time. Listen, I heard somebody say this recently. God's timing is everything. Don't lose hope because you have to wait. Just because you don't see it happening in this moment doesn't mean that God's not working In fact, I was thinking about the the period of time between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. It's a period of about 400 years. We call it the intertestamental period. And it was a time when some scholars say God was absolutely silent from the time that the last prophet of the Old Testament put that pen down from writing what he had written until the opening uh, events of the New Testament. There were 400 years where it seems like God was not moving at all. But remember, like 700 years before the writing of the book of Matthew. 700 years, there were prophecies that were going forth about what God was going to do. He saw the issues that his people were facing. And so he says, you know what? There is going to be a a virgin that conceives and bears a son. And that son is going to be Emmanuel, God with us. That was a prophecy that went out 700 years before Matthew. And I could just see all of the people of Israel during the 400 years of silence saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? And it's silent because the time is not yet. But in God's mind, he sees the prophetic calendar already. He knows the date that it's going to happen. And he's just waiting for the moment when it was the right time. He knows. He's preparing. He's getting things behind the scene working out, even though the people of Israel didn't know. Can I promise you today, no matter how long you've been waiting, God's going to answer. And it will be in his time. Let me give you another one. God answers prayer in his own way. I love Zechariah 4. The people of God were trying to accomplish some great things in Zechariah. 
but they got frustrated and they got stymied a little bit and God finally came to them and said, it's not gonna happen by human might. It's not gonna happen by human power. It's going to happen by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He's gonna answer in his time. He's gonna answer in his way. Number three, he's gonna answer according to his own power. Isn't it funny how when we're faced with something, a lot of times the first thing that we do is go to us. How creative can I get? How ingenuous can I get? How, this is what he said, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think, watch this, according to the power that works in us. Yes, he might use you to accomplish his purpose, but if he does that, it's not you. It's his power operating on the inside of you. And by the way, that takes the pressure off. You don't have to make up a solution. You don't have to grit your teeth and just try to force a solution. All you have to do is let the power of God operate in your life and he will answer the prayer in his own power. He will also answer his prayer for his own purpose. This is one of the most challenging things about prayer, guys, because we know what we want. God knows what we need. I want you to hear this, the words of this in 1 John 5, starting in verse 14. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. This is amazing that if we pray in line with the will of God, it is going to happen. Period, exclamation point, it's going to happen. The issue is that we often think we know what's best. And so we're not like Jesus in the garden. Jesus in the garden is praying, not my will, but your will be done. What we often pray is, God, I don't care about your will. Let my will be done. I realize this may be the way you think it should be done, God, but this is what I want. One man said it this way, God has editing rights over our prayers. He will edit them. He will correct them. He will bring them back in line with his will and then hand them back to us to be resubmitted. <laughs> And this is why Jesus could say in John 14 and verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that my Father may be glorified in the Son. Do you realize that when Jesus says we're doing something in his name, that it's not just tacking on the name of Jesus to the end of everything that we do? There's a value in calling out the name of Jesus, yes, but it's not like you know praying for your food, Lord bless this food, forgive me for what I'm about to eat, in Jesus' name. It's not just that. God, I'm... Thank you for the opportunity to charge up my credit card at the store today in Jesus' name. It's not, it's not just tacking on the name of Jesus. When he says that you're going to do this in Jesus' name, it's talking about the power of attorney. It's talking about him giving you the authority to actually do something in his name, just like he himself was standing there. And so he's saying, when you ask for something, just like I would ask for something. You seen those bracelets? What would Jesus do? We need to start a new one. How would Jesus pray? Because if you ask the way and for what he would ask, and in his name, he says, I'm gonna do it, that God will receive the glory. I gotta stop. The ultimate conversation. Listen, it's not just about putting in your time. I went through that, I, I'm being honest with you, I went through that in a season of my life where prayer for me was punching a time card. Put my hour in today, God, ching. Where's my paycheck? I wanted the reward for the time spent. It just, it went from relationship into this religious ritual. And it, I, it was like the Old Testament where the Bible says that Israel was serving him with their lips, but their heart was far from him. God doesn't want that. 
Nobody wants that in relationship, right? You don't want to go hang out with somebody and they punch the time card and say, well, we just spent our quality time together. Wasn't that great? I was talking to Robin the other day. My baby. My honey. November, 30 years. Me and Robin, yeah. I was telling her the other day, you know what? When she and I have to be apart, I don't doubt for one second the status of our relationship. I'm not worried. She's not out looking at other guys. Look what she's got at home. Come on. (laughs) That was pretty funny right there. I don't doubt the status of our relationship because we love one another. And so I'm not worried about it when we're apart, but you know what? It's just better when we're together. God said it's not good that man should be alone. He said, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with the Lord. I got some favor. So I'm not worried about it when we're apart, but it's just so awesome when we're together. And I wanna encourage somebody today. I realize when it comes to prayer, you know, some of us might feel guilty or ashamed, you know, because we feel like, man, I should be praying more. I should be talking to God more. I should be doing spiritual things more. Stop that. Stop that mentality. There is no question about the status of your relationship with God. You are a child of God and he loves you and that's not gonna change. If you're busy and you forget to pray one day, he still loves you. If you pray five minutes one day, he still loves you. Guess what? There's no problem with your relationship if you happen to be busy and you can't have those moments of connection. But guess what? It's in addition to the fact that your relationship is stable, it's just so much better when you're together because you were created for this. You were created for relationship with God. You were created for this conversation. I'm just believing right now that somebody is receiving what God is speaking into your heart, going back to Psalm 91. Call on me and I will answer. Call on me and I will answer. If you've never had that kind of relationship with God or maybe it's not that way for you right now and it used to be, you can have that today. Let me just give you this and then I wanna pray with you. If you've never had this, Romans 10, 13 says this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon me and I will answer. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will save you. Just call on him. That's not the end though. It says, then he will come close to you. Psalm 145, verse 18, the Lord is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call out to him sincerely. Do you know what that verse makes me want to do? The Lord is close to everyone who calls out. It makes me want to call out because he's close. And then salvation, man, thank God for saving me, but thank you for coming close to me. But then look at this, Exodus 33, 11. And so the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. What he really wants is to call you his friend. I want to pray with you. For those of you that want to enter into this conversation, maybe you've never done it before. Maybe it's the first time. I want to pray with you. And while we're praying, just just call on Jesus. Just call on the name of the Lord in your own way. You can do it quietly. You can vocalize it. You can do whatever you want, but just call on him. And I want to pray for people that have been so busy and distracted, and this is me so much of the time, so busy and so distracted. And I want to remember he's as close as the mention of his name. I want to pray for those of us that have been missing out on the benefits of something that we've had before, but maybe we've let it just get pushed aside because of all of that. And then I want to pray for our church family. I want to pray for this vision of of seeing every person 
praying. I want, I want to see it in such a way that the people that are in University City and the Shaw neighborhood and St. Louis and the surrounding communities, I want to see it to the point where people in the community are saying, listen, I've heard about One Family Church and that's a church that prays. If you need prayer, you need to connect with somebody at One Family Church because they're not just going to pray with you in three days. They'll pray with you like right now in this moment. They're going to do that. I want to pray for our church family in that way as well. Would you do it? Just close your eyes for a moment and let's pray together. Father, right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I, I lift up every person in this place today. As I've been talking about this conversation with you, Lord, something has been stirring in the hearts of some people that have never had this before. Maybe they're like Chris, who I talked about today, who literally never had a conversation with you before, didn't know how to even start in talking to you. I pray, God, for them right now that they would turn their heart toward you in faith, that they would trust you and what you did through Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection and believe that it's sufficient to take care of all of my sin problem, God, and to remove all of the distance between us and you. And I pray, God, for every person in that situation right now. I pray, Lord, that you would just save them, come close to them, and call them friend. I pray for every person in our church family, Lord, who has just gotten overwhelmed by life and prayer has become something on the back burner. I pray, God, right now that you would just remind us of the awesome benefits of this conversation with you. I pray you'd remind us, God, that you're longing to be with us. You're not looking for anything specific, just time with your children. I pray you would help us, God, turn our hearts toward you. And I pray, God, for our church family. I pray that this vision would be accomplished, that literally we would see every person praying, that we would pray when we get up, we pray throughout the day, we pray in the evenings, God. We would literally pray without ceasing. We would be in an ongoing conversation with you no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. And I pray, God, that as a result of that incredible conversation, that we would all grow closer to you and closer to each other. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. I want to give you uh, some ways that you can respond today. This is what I would really love. There's, we talked about the QR code a few moments ago and how you can take that card and you can use your phone to click in there and you can do this digitally. You can communicate anything you want. I would love it if you would share a prayer request today that all 140 plus people on our Echo Prayer app will be praying about. I would love to see that you're saying, I wanna to join together with other people in my church family and pray about this. I would also love, we were talking about the testimony of what God has done in our life. I would love for you to use that card and just share with me what God has done in your life. I would love to hear about that. Our team would love to hear. We'd love to celebrate with you what God, what God has done in your life. So use that to connect with us, that QR code. Another way you can respond today is through your giving. If you're part of One Family Church, and one of the things we do is we're accomplishing a mission of bringing people and God together in love. And we're doing that here locally. We're doing that even nationally and globally. And if you're part of our church family, we do that. We accomplish that through our giving as we participate in tithes and offerings. I want to encourage you to do that. You can do that with a QR code as well. You can do that on our website, wherever you'd like to give. And then also right after this service, another way. Is to, is to get more connected with One Family Church as your church family by going to our next steps class. Steps three is, step three is happening right after this service upstairs in the family center. The team will meet you out front if you're interested in being a part of that. But this is a good one because this is, this is about growing in our faith. It's about growing in our relationship with God and each other. You don't want to miss this one. It's good. Step three. And then one more way before we worship the Lord together again. I want to encourage you to stop by the prayer room, the theater to your right as you're going out. You can take communion there. There's a self-directed way to do communion. And there's prayer team members that'll be there to pray with you. If you've got something you wanna just have somebody agree with you in prayer about. And I don't know about you guys, but I just feel like faith has kind of built up in my heart today. And I'm just believing that God really does answer prayer. 
Does anybody else believe that? Hallelujah.